You're listening to the Global Ed Podcast, where educators share inspiring and thought-provoking stories from around the world. In this episode of the Global Ed Podcast, I speak with Yaya. Growing up in Burkina Faso, Yaya knows the education system and the challenges its young people face. After being selected to be a member of the Obama Foundation for African Leaders and being involved in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Yaya has returned to Burkina Faso to create young changemakers through education. Welcome to the podcast, Yaya. Thank you so much, Jess Gavin. How are you? I'm great. Thank you, Yaya. Uh, I'm really excited to speak with you and I can't wait to hear what you have to share with us. A landlocked West African country, Burkina Faso, once known as Upper Volta, gained independence from France in 1960. A turbulent political history followed, marked by multiple coups and regime changes. In 1983, Captain Thomas Sankara took power and renamed the country Burkina Faso. His legacy, though cut short by assassination, remains impactful, advocating for self-sufficiency and women's rights. The country may be small, but its history is mighty. Now, Burkina Faso isn't a place that I know much about. So, Yaya, could you give me some background into your country, please? Burkina Faso is a Francophone African country, so it was colonized uh, by, by France, as uh, other many uh, African countries. So, uh, we worked to have our independence in the 1960s. So, since then, Burkina Faso has uh, had a lot of uh, presidents so who've been l- ruling or leading the country. Some uh, were elected, like democratical elections, and they became uh, presidents. And some also uh, came uh, to the power out of a coup because uh, the name of Burkina Faso before was Ape Volta. That was the name given to the country by the colonizers. And when we had our uh, revolutionary president known as Thomas Sankara, so uh, he decided to change the name of the country from uh, the from the country of Upper Volta to Burkina Faso. So Burkina Faso means the country of upright men and upright women. Could you give me a idea of the sort of the demographics of the people who live in uh, Burkina Faso, please? So uh, Burkina Faso is uh, also a country of multiple religious uh, communities. We have. Uh, uh, Christians, uh, Catholics, Protestants, we have Muslims, and we have traditionalists. But despite of all these different religion groups, so we live together peacefully, and we have inter-religious dialogue activity that we organize every time where Muslims and Christians collaborate to organize uh, outdoor activities, invite one another during uh, religious celebrations. So we don't have any problem but we have a diverse community in terms of ethnic, in terms of religion. So with all those different ethnic groups in Burkina Faso, um, is there a common language or does um, each area speak its own language? So we have uh, a set of more than 60 ethnic groups in the country and more, uh, and, and, uh, more than 60 local languages that we speak in Burkina Faso. Um, in terms of employment, uh, what are the main industries that form the economy for Burkina Faso? Main economy of the country is uh, agricultural activities and also mining operations. So these are basically the two major economical fields of the country. As I start to think about education in the country, do most uh, young people go to school or are they involved in the industries of the country? Yes, yes, yes. That is also a challenge at some places. Yes, it's a challenge because at some villages, so it depends on the region. There are some regions, so it's not a big problem, but there are some regions mainly where we have like the mining site, the mining site, uh, local mining site. So we have many, many children now. Instead of going to school, they prefer to go on mining site and find gold. So uh, this is a main reason of students drop out of school at some areas. And also because of the poverty, the social situation of some parents. So children are obliged to become like small traders where they have to walk around the cities and sell certain uh, things to have money and even support their parents and also uh, support their studies. Yeah. Um, What's been the sort of the traditional view of education in the country? I can call it a system that was uh, designed 
by the colonizers for their needs. And the education system at the very beginning were mainly tailored for uh, people to have access to education, but basically to be able to learn how to read and write, to speak the French language, because the, it was a cultural objective and work for the cause of the colonizers. Those were the main, main, main objectives of, the, 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 of education uh, at the very beginning. Since the country's gained independence, has that changed much? Is the approach to education different now? So we can have a secular uh, system where we have uh, freedom of religion. So like in schools in Burkina Faso, every child is uh, allowed to practice the religion that he wants. And uh, those schools are basically public schools. So in Burkina Faso, we have many public schools where the majority of uh, children uh, go to school. But we also have some private schools which are most of the time expensive, where the middle class families and those who have a bit of means of uh, financial means can send their children to. So uh, in terms of uh, state of education in Burkina Faso, so Burkina has a situation that is similar to many uh, West African countries. So which means that um, we have some challenges that the education sector in Burkina Faso is facing. Mainly we have the issue of infrastructures, so which is not sometimes easy because in some places, so students don't even have uh, uh, classes. So they take classes, courses outside, sometimes under trees. So, uh, and in one classroom, so we can have sometimes 100 students in one class and sometimes even more. Wow. So... Uh, I've got to ask, how do you teach 100 students in a single class? I mean, that that does sound like a significant challenge. So uh, this is, uh, unfortunately, a sad reality in Burkina Faso and in many West African countries. So sometimes uh, in one village, well, you may have like one school. And the number of children of, who have the age to go to school uh, is maybe the double of what the school can receive as a normal uh, number of students in the classroom. So if those schools will operate, uh, well, maybe saying that, well, we we don't have enough space for kids to come to school, it means that many children will not go to school. So that's why sometimes to uh, manage and give the chance to those kids to have access to education, they are obliged to take more than what is expected. But teachers are struggling to, uh, uh, to, to, to find solutions. And sometimes the teacher doesn't have a space to walk around the student. And some kids, to even walk, they are obliged to jump on tables to be able to, uh, to, 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 to walk within the classrooms. So uh, it is a reality. Uh, I can say that now the private sector is becoming a very, a very powerful house to provide education because now we have private schools, uh, like individual people are building their own schools so uh, to come to support the government because we know that the government alone cannot um, provide education to all the children of the country. I suppose there's a large number of students there who can't afford private education and it would seem that in some areas the government system seems to be uh, over capacity. So does that lead to students not attending school? And um, if so, what do they do instead? It's sad because you can see that those kids, uh, most of the time when they don't go to school, uh, they become street children. So they will be uh, walking around the streets, not going to school, not having any education and uh, the sad aspect also is sometimes because the type of insecurity that we have in my country is terrorist issue. And you can see that sometimes those terrorist groups can even enroll some of their young soldiers from those kids. At some places it happens where we have some students who drop out of school who are enrolled as young soldiers who work with these people, unfortunately. These are terrorist groups going around finding street children to become child soldiers. Is that right? Yes, exactly. It's terrorist groups. So uh, at some places, well, you can see that, uh, unfortunately, children are also part of terrorists. But at some places, they they force them to join them. Uh, They oblige them to join them. And unfortunately, it, it happens sometimes. 
A massacre in northeast Burkina Faso, in which more than 130 people were killed this month, was carried out mostly by children between the ages of 12 and 14. That's what the United Nations and the government are saying. One of the main challenges that education is facing, the education sector is facing now in Burkina Faso, is the issue of insecurity, which is having a lot of negative impact on our development sectors. So now... There are many, many villages that are internally displaced because uh, they no longer live at their original places because of uh, war. I mean, the, the insecurity issue, they were obliged to move from their villages to safe places. So uh, because of that, we have many schools that are closed. And also, even unfortunately, at some places, uh, some teachers were even killed. Even, with, with, uh, even some students also, unfortunately, lost their lives. Uh, because of the issue of insecurity. With the insecurity, does that continue on this cycle of students not attending school and so ending up on the street? Uh, and if so, is there any government or international response to try and break that cycle? Um, the majority of them are most of the time uh, in the street. So uh, walking around, begging people to have food to eat. But uh, the good news is that we have a lot of non-profit organizations which are fighting uh, to support uh, those kids because uh, most of them are living at um, different camps where uh, the, the, the international organizations like the UNICEF or the humanitarian aid organizations are providing uh, sources of education where uh, we continue to support those kids to not uh, totally forget anything, all the things that they learn but to even have the possibility to continue uh, having access to education. In terms of the government's response, um, how are they seeking to address the issues? We have a young president, if I will not say the youngest president of Africa, whose name is Ibrahim Traore, so who uh, came also out of a coup, but now is trying to change the narrative of our country because uh, now the country is working on an internal strategy to get rid more and more of uh, the colonizers of the superpower that are sometimes uh, having impact, uh, handicaps on the development of the country. So now the country is, has adopted new strategies to work uh, and have certain changes in the country and mainly face the issue of insecurity. Now, Yaya, you grew up in Burkina Faso, so could you give us a sense of what your experience was like going through the education system there? My story with education is really interesting because I am the first child of my family to go to school. Uh, I have, uh, uh, we are eight, yes, we are eight children in our, seven, eight children, sorry, we are seven children in my family. I have three elder brothers and, and three younger brothers. We are all we are all boys in my family. Being the first child to go to school is not only a privilege, but it is also a challenge because you are the first one who have a formal education. So uh, that will probably help you to, uh, uh, to, to, to have a lot of opportunities. First, you will be educated, you will have access to trainings and so on. And more importantly, you will also have the possibility to um, to have a job with the public sector. Because from the view of many people in my country, uh, when you go to school, you have a good education after you have a job. So uh, you are considered as someone who has succeeded in his life. Were there any um, sort of barriers or hurdles for you in your um, in your community to accessing education? Uh, in my community, I'm from a Muslim community, uh, and uh, the Muslim community in my country were hesitating a lot to send their children to school. The first schools in my country were religious schools, uh, mainly Catholic schools, because the missionary schools that we had used to give uh, education, uh, but they also used to give religious education. And many, many Muslim communities, Muslim parents, hesitated a long time because for them, they, when they send their children to school, instead of having like a formal education, they will change their religion. 
they will change, they will, they will abandon their Muslim religion to become Catholics. And that was a, a reality that used to be like that, where we have many Muslim children who uh, converted from Islam to Christianity because of uh, the schools where they go to study. And the narrative have changed now uh, more and more with the building a lot of public schools and private schools. So um, now I can say that um, that situation have changed. Muslim are attending their children everywhere to study in the country, out of the country. So uh, that was a barrier to many children in my village. But uh, with us, the situation have started to change and uh, people have started sending their children to school to have access to education because they realize that uh, when you send your child to school, uh, he will have an education that will allow him to be competitive at the national, at the international level and so on. So once you'd finished your secondary education, uh, what did you do after that? So when I finished my high school, decided to study English so uh, at the university. So I, I, I went to the public university, the biggest public university, the largest public university in my country. And uh, I studied English and I spent three years to have the license degree. So when you finish that uh, um, studies, the main thing you can do is to teach. So uh, then I started teaching in some private schools for around three to four years before applying for a job position in international private schools. So I don't work with the government. I mainly work in private schools, from local private school to international private schools. Yaya, since you started teaching, uh, you've become involved in a number of initiatives for change related to education, uh, including being part of the Obama Foundation and being involved in the UN and also the African Union. Can you tell me about those experiences and how they've inspired and influenced you? So uh, in 2018, I applied for the Obama Foundation uh, African Leaders Program because when Obama finished his mandacy as a president of the US, he created his foundation and he started the work in Africa. The foundation was launched in South Africa. So I was lucky to be part of the first cohort of African uh, leaders to be selected. And I am the first certified uh, leader of the Obama Foundation in my country. And since then, with the Obama Foundation, I've been involved in a lot of uh, programs. We have uh, the African Union also, where I am an ambassador of the African Union International Center. I also have my own nonprofit organization called 12 for Education that I created after my participation in the Obama Foundation program. So where we try to promote quality and inclusive ed education in Burkina Faso. And I had the opportunity to be invited by the UN uh, in 2022 to attend the UN General Assembly in, the, in New York. Uh, to attend uh, the UN Transforming Education Summit, uh, where I uh, talk like there, where I, I went as a speaker. I, I was invited by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to attend the Global Goals um, Award Ceremony, which is a very global event that tried to um, encourage all the people who are working to um, achieve uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, where uh, teachers are trained to promote the education for sustainable development within schools. And thanks to all these programs, I was able to create the first ever SDGs club of my country, where I try to train the change maker, young change makers, so to promote uh, the SDGs in their different communities and become solution providers. So I have a lot of, lot of opportunity that I have and uh, where I'm trying to also uh, create a new generation of change makers where I share my own experience with them. Africa's growing population of young people is an economic resource that could bring positive change to the continent's economic future. With proper planning and investment in its youth, African countries could experience what is known as a demographic dividend. This happens when the working population outnumbers children and the elderly. This results in economic resources being freed up as the labor force grows faster than the population that is dependent on it. Central for achieving a bright future is investing in people through health, education and jobs. 
Burkina Faso has a young population which could be used to maximise the benefits that come from a demographic dividend. But how would you say the country is placed at the moment to maximise this opportunity? We inherited an education system that is not um, that is that does not adapt to the needs of the country. We have an education system where we have thousands of students who go to school, graduate from universities. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, they 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 have a lot of problems to have to have jobs because the training they receive from schools and universities don't match with the the needs of the country. So we have a generalist uh, system uh, where we don't have a lot of vocational training, where the training is not mainly practical, a lot of theories. But at the end of the day, so we are not able to do things with our two hands. We are more generalistic. So this is a big, big, big issue now in Burkina Faso. And we need to rethink our educational uh, system uh, to take into account uh, the needs of the country to make sure that we have students who will, at the end of the day, have skills that will help them to uh, have jobs. With your work and foundation, what are some of the initiatives you are involved in that will help to prepare and educate future generations? Yes, uh, the social initiatives that we are having are basically uh, to promote um, uh, reading literacy programs. Like we create uh, book clubs in schools. So because we all know uh, the power of reading, uh, the power of reading is really tremendous. So we try to provide uh, programs to schools to, to, to create book clubs and we collect books and we donate to schools uh, to have them in their libraries to have reading and book clubs. These are things we do. We also promote English clubs because uh, with, because of the language importance, I try to also promote English club as this is my uh, studies field. So we create English club and we try to do debate in English and help people to learn English. Those are some of the things that we do and now we are more, moving more and more to girls empowerment programs to provide leadership, technology and uh, women leadership issues uh, to, to, to high school girls. And more importantly, to internally displaced children to help them have access to education. So what's being done on the ground for these internally displaced children who've been pushed out of their villages and are at risk of becoming child soldiers? Uh, is there something that's been put in place to help stop that? So the internally displaced children uh, are organized by the government. They have different sites where they live. So whenever somebody like an organization would like to uh, give them a service, some people go to teach them uh, basic things. Some even go to train uh, their parents themselves to have uh, some uh, practical training like how to make soap, how to take care of themselves, the basic needs. In addition to your foundation, I know that you also work with a group called ENCO Education who are looking to empower African learners. Uh, what does your work with that group entail? All right. So uh, the ENCO Education Group, I've been working with them since 2019. My main work now is to raise funds to support our scholarship program because we provide scholarship uh, opportunities to many African children. But uh, I manage the program. I make sure that we select the students who are really in need to have those scholarships and join the ENCO schools in Africa. And when they start attending the school, um, what's the long-term hope for them? All right. So uh, that is uh, linked to the mission of the ENCO Education Group, which is trying to provide a quality education to African children and more importantly, allowing them to have access to international universities globally. So this is our mission at ENCO, and we provide the IB Diploma Program. So uh, the hope is to allow these kids to have quality education. And uh, when we offer them those scholarships, they are sometimes 100% scholarship in terms of school fees. So we provide them 100 scholarship fees, and sometimes it can be less than 100%. But uh, the scholarship are really important because... Uh, as ENCO is providing an international private education, uh, so it is not always easy for many, many families to have uh, the means to send their children in those type of schools. So because of that, uh, ENCO is also uh, dedicating some part of his budget so to support uh, those unprivileged 
excellent student to have access to this type of education in many African countries where uh, the group is operating. So, and well, we have some, some students who, thanks to the scholarship, they graduated from the baccalaureate level and they are now studying in many, many famous universities uh, globally. Sounds like there's some great work happening through that group. Um, but Yaya, with everything you've done, uh, what are your personal aspirations for the future? Well, uh, my professional aspiration is to uh, be an expert of education at the global level because I'm still studying despite my professional work. I have, uh, I'm on a master's program and now uh, in teachers' professional development. Uh, I work on uh, the theme uh, uh, effect of teachers' professional development uh, on the student uh, academic uh, results. So I want to be an expert of education, uh, work globally with organizations like the UN, like the African Union, and uh, well, to serve my community also at the uh, governmental level, why not one day to become a minister of education? So it's also a possibility. <laughs> As we conclude our time together, Yaya, um, what are your hopes for the nation of Burkina Faso? My hope for the nation of Burkina Faso, I hope uh, I, for my country, I really hope for total independence. Total independence because uh, many African countries were colonized. They got their independence. They can call themselves as independent countries, but unfortunately, we still have like a type of neo-colonialism that is still going on, where we have those former powers, colonial powers, who are still trying to control those former colonies. And this is something that uh, my country and other countries of the region are coming together to really make sure that we have a real independence, where we can talk to other nations like partners, not like uh, masters and subordinates and decide what we want for our communities and prepare the future of our country. It's not easy, but we hope that we will succeed. And what are your hopes for the young people of Burkina Faso? We are trying to change a lot of things because the biggest problem of many African countries like my country was that because of the lack of education, uh, they were not able to understand certain type of things when it comes to national issues. But now, more and more, we have literate people who understand their basic needs, who are fighting for their basic rights. And I hope that the future of my country is, uh, is something that we can be proud of it. And it requires a lot of sacrifices to make sure that we also prepare a, a better future for our young generation. So I have a tremendous hope for our children in Burkina Faso. Thank you, Yaya, for sharing about Burkina Faso, its people, and the work that you and so many others are doing to build that nation. I wish you all the very best in all of your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gavin, for inviting me to this podcast, and I wish you all the best to empower people in terms of education and also to uh, spread the voice of education around the world. Next time on the Global Ed Podcast. In episode five, I interview the Director General of the IB and the former Finland Minister for Education, Mr. Oli Pekka Heinonen. Life is messy and complex. It's true. But at the same time, life is extremely exciting and beautiful. Those are the things that I often see. I see the curiosity in the eyes of young people. I see them hungry for knowing more. I see them hungry to tell their answers. Mr. Heinen shares his journey from Minister to Director General and how he sees education being the key to tackling global issues. If you have enjoyed listening to the Globe Led podcast, please subscribe and follow me, Gavin Kinch, on LinkedIn.